Hi, and welcome to the program, Optimizing Incision Management Following Ambulatory Surgery. My name is Tim Alton. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Seattle, Washington. I work with ProLiance Orthopedic Associates. These are my disclosures. Uh, this program was funded by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education and supported by a generous grant from 3M Healthcare Medical Solutions Division. The learning objectives for our session are to recognize the clinical and economic impacts of postoperative complications in ambulatory surgery. Uh, specifically, we are going to examine the role of closed incision negative pressure therapy for incision and surrounding soft tissue management to help reduce the risk of surgical site complications, readmissions, and postoperative follow-up appointments. Uh, I'll use cases to help uh, explore some of these best practices and techniques that I use to manage the surgical site and enhance my postoperative recovery for patients uh, specifically focused on the ambulatory surgery setting. So here's an outline. Uh, we'll start out with a case example of closed incision negative pressure therapy in an ambulatory surgery setting. And then we're gonna go through some of what we do to prevent infections in hip and knee replacement patients, specifically tailored to the ambulatory surgery center. I'll cover some basic science for closed incision negative therapy and some of the clinical evidence for negative pressure therapy as well. And then conclude with the completion of that case that was performed at my ASC. So closed incision negative pressure therapy in the ambulatory setting. This case is of a 58 year old female, uh, worked for a local airline producer, had a host of medical problems, came into my office and was having difficult time with her hip. Uh, she's diabetic, she's obese, she smokes, she has a history of factor V Leiden, a clotting disorder, and had a DVT unprovoked previously. Smoked a pack per day, good social support at home, and had a metalgic gait. Uh, her body mass index was 42, and upon examination in the clinic, she had a large panis. Very common patient that we would see in the orthopedic clinic. This is her x-ray demonstrating severe osteoarthritis to the left hip, this is what I tell her is bone on bone type arthritis or end of the road arthritis. And she was really, really limited by this and was having a great deal of pain. Now, I'm fortunate that I work at a private practice where we own an ambulatory surgery center and we are able to do hip and knee replacement surgeries in that setting. But in order to get this particular patient into the ambulatory setting, we needed to optimize some of her preoperative risk factors. So we got her diabetes under control, got her A1C down to 6.9. Because of her clotting history, we elected to use a stronger than aspirin post-operative DVT prophylaxis medication. We supported her in weight loss, got her body mass index down to 37, checked her nutrition labs, and those all came back great. We had her quit smoking, and admittedly, we rely on our primary care provider to help us with that. And then we had her pass the serum cottoning test to prove that she had stopped using nicotine products before surgery. This was her soft tissue envelope at the time of surgery. I commonly do anterior approach total hip replacements, which is an upcoming trend and a very common way to do this procedure. And I was able to tape some of that panis out of the way. I did our standard prep with a chlorhexidine based solution and then draped and re-prepped the skin. I put my IO band over the incision and then did a hip replacement for her. And so these are her post-operative images showing a left total hip replacement. And it looks really good. I was happy with this. And fortunately the patient was doing well. Ignore the zipper that's on her pants and pay attention to the panis that you can see overlying her entire astabular component, the femoral head, neck, and the proximal extent of her stem, just speaking to her large body mass index. And so the surgery went according to plan, no major issues. I utilized a negative pressure dressing for her skin and a 10A inhibitor postoperatively. 
Her post-operative course is exactly what I would want for my hip replacement patients. She demonstrated that she could walk and do stairs safely and discharged home the same day. She was showering the next morning, removed her own dressing at seven days post-operatively. She had a telemedicine visit at her two-week visit, and then I saw her back in the office at six weeks. Very standard post-operative course in this modern post-COVID era. I asked to see her incision and she pulled up her shirt to show me the image on the left and I was taken back from it. I was like, wait a minute, there's no incision there. And then she elevated her pants and you can see the incision that was hiding underneath, but well healed, no drainage, no redness, had healed beautifully in spite of being completely covered by her pants. So to me, this is a success story. This is a home run for hip replacement surgery in the ambulatory setting. And the closed incision negative pressure dressing was one factor that helped us to have a successful patient experience. Ambulatory surgery centers and orthopedics are becoming much more common. We have heard this said a lot lately. We've been living through some strange times. The COVID-19 pandemic created a crucible for healthcare. Here in the United States, specifically Seattle, Washington, where I live, had one of the first cases of COVID and our healthcare system was dramatically impacted by this. I remember it like it was yesterday, nursing home facility, COVID patient, it's in our community, what is this gonna look like? There was a lot of fear, there was a lot of anxiety, and there was a lot of changes to the healthcare system. Specifically, elective joint replacement surgeries were restricted in ways that we have not seen, at least in my career or in a generation's time, uh, to the point where we were told by local government officials that we couldn't do elective hip and knee replacement surgery. So there was a significant constriction in our access to providing these operations for patients. And as with most systems, when you apply stress to it, adaptation occurs and orthopedics is no different. And this crucible of COVID-19 has accelerated the transition of hip and knee replacements from the inpatient to ambulatory surgery center in my personal practice, my local community, and I believe across the United States. When you look at predictions by the folks that analyze the markets and compare numbers, here's some data to look at. Now, this is a prediction of procedure growth favoring ambulatory centers, comparing what they think it's going to look like 2018 compared to 2028. And if you look at these four different categories, ambulatory surgery centers are expected or projected to have a 25% increase in the number of cases done in those settings. Here's another way to look at this data. If you look at the Ambulatory Surgery Centers, or the ASC, you'll see that the volume 2018 is expected to be 30 million. 2028, 37 million, 7 million increase. Compare this to inpatient volumes, 2018 to 2028 projection, flat line, 17 million straight across. So if you're looking for an area of growth with procedures over the next decade, indicators are already pointing towards ambulatory surgery centers increasing with regards to their volume. Combine that with a pandemic that has stressed this system, and I think that you're going to see that trend continue and accelerate favoring ambulatory surgery centers. Why are these changes happening? Yeah, we talked about the COVID pandemic, but it's more complicated than that, as you would expect. These are some factors that I think contribute. Physician ownership, entrepreneurial nature, and the desire for control. This is one of the main reasons that I joined a private practice is so that I can have a significant stake in the runnings of my business. And I think drive some innovations and efficiencies and be a part of that process. And so physician ownership is important when it comes to driving cases towards an ambulatory setting. Another issue is capacity for operating rooms. We talked about this with COVID, but when the hospital tells you you can't use these operating rooms to do total joint replacements, you can't do it. And moving forward, the capacity of ambulatory surgery centers is increasing as more ambulatory surgery centers appear in our community. 
And then finally, consumerism plays into this. Cost transparency, lower co-pays, convenience. These are all things that patients care about. And oftentimes, ambulatory settings can provide total hip and total knee replacement surgeries at a decreased cost to the healthcare system compared to inpatient settings. So there is a market drive to move business to the ambulatory settings. And if that means lower co-pays for patients and a more convenient experience, I think they're going to go for that. When you look at what procedures in orthopedics are changing uh, to the outpatient setting, we have three columns here. Ones that have already shifted, and most people are aware of this, arthroscopy, carpal tunnels, rotator cuffs, ACLs, those are already done in an ambulatory center. Procedures that are unlikely to shift to the ambulatory setting would be joint revisions, trauma surgeries. Often the implants are very expensive for joint revisions. The patients are sicker, they're more complicated surgeries. Trauma patients commonly have other things going on that need inpatient medical care. But in the center orange box, primary knee replacement, primary hip replacements, those will mostly or predominantly be outpatient in the next 10 years. So those are the procedures that we anticipate to be shifting to the ambulatory setting. Now that's a big deal when you look at the numbers. So this illustrates 2018 volumes, 93% of primary knee replacements, 93% of primary hip replacements are the orange box, which is inpatient. That equates to almost 750,000 knee replacements and 530,000 hip replacements. That's a lot of volume and those are being done inpatient. So if you look at that change that per projected shift over the next 10 years, primary hip and primary knee replacements will see an increase in their outpatient volumes, 1,000% for knee replacements, 712% increase in hip replacements done in the ambulatory setting. Overall, 53% of total joint replacements nationally expected to be done in the outpatient setting in 10 years. So this is a trend that we've seen has already started. It's been accelerated by the COVID pandemic and it will continue to proceed as a result of lower cost, physician ownership of the ambulatory setting and the bundled payment model which will drive business towards these low cost centers. There are some forces to overcome to maintain the status quo. Uh, some of those are implant costs, some of those are reimbursement rates and additionally patient factors. And so when I look at this trend moving forward as an owner of an ambulatory center, I see an opportunity to drive as much business as I can to the ambulatory center. Some of these things are not in my control. Bundled payments, cost of implants, some of those things are hard to regulate. But patient factors are something I and my care team can control. And we can optimize our patients before surgery to get them as safe and as healthy as possible to prevent complications, to lower the overall cost of the episode of care, and hopefully drive volume to the ambulatory center. Now, I will explain to you over the rest of this discussion how I think negative pressure dressings are a part of that recipe for success. We've all heard the term bundle busters. What this means is there are a particular set of patients who are very expensive to take care of with regards to their hip and their knee replacement. A bundle is an amount of money that a team receives for doing a hip and knee replacement. It's thought that you pay X amount of dollars and that's how much you get for pre-op visit, surgery, post-op visits for the first 90 days. That's a bundle. If somebody has a complication in that window of time, it becomes much more expensive than what the accepted amount of payment is for that episode of care. And so that busts the bundle. And there are all sorts of different ways that physicians and care teams are on the hook for that or how that gets uh, sorted out. But those are the types of patients that we are really trying to identify and optimize and avoid busting bundles in the ambulatory setting. Infections are expensive. Annual estimated cost per prosthetic joint infection in the United States ranges from 
to $116,000. So when these happen, they bust the bundle, they cost a lot of money to the healthcare system. And these are issues that we desperately, desperately try to avoid. When a patient has an infected joint replacement, that means more follow-up visits likely to an emergency department or an urgent care, even to a clinical setting, an admission to the hospital, an additional one, two, or more surgeries, an inpatient admission, IV antibiotics, multiple nights in the hospital, sometimes required in-home infusions or care at a skilled nursing facility. These are all things that we do not mention for just a standard primary hip and knee replacement operation. And that's why surgeons become so passionate about infection prevention. And that's why we care so much about optimizing patients before surgery and what dressings we can use to help decrease these complications postoperatively. And I believe this care, not only inherent to doctors who I think in general are trying to do the right things for their patients, but they're also financially motivated if they have a stake in the ambulatory center and the overall profitability of that enterprise. Surgeon Ambulatory Surgery Center ownership is very common in the United States. The goals of ownership of an ambulatory surgery center are number one, patients first. You want to provide the best possible care that you can for your patients in the safest fashion. Ultimately, it's a business and you're trying to be profitable in that business. And not only are you trying to be profitable, but as a part owner, you have a vested stake in the business and you often see some of the downstream impacts of profitability. So those are some of the thoughts that surgeons have when they decide to be part of an ambulatory surgery center ownership team. When it comes to ambulatory centers, you want those operating rooms full and you want them operating at full capacity. That's how you become profitable. You're efficient at full capacity. There are barriers to achieving that. Patient comorbidities and reimbursement are two of the main barriers that we run into. Clinical setting, you're looking, you know, I just did this today. I was in the office and I'm signing up patients for surgery, checking their insurance. Are they contracted with our ambulatory surgery center? What comorbidities does this person have that I can identify that I know that puts them into an unsafe risk category for surgery, and we should avoid, number one, doing their surgery or optimize them, and are they a candidate for a surgery at the ambulatory surgery center? Because I want them to be, I want to drive that business that direction. So these are some of the factors that are going on behind the scenes that surgeons are thinking about and care about when it comes to ambulatory surgery center ownership and doing hip and knee replacement surgeries in that setting. There's only so much money available to take care of these patients, to pay for the episode of care, to pay the staff. And we as surgeons who have a stake in our ambulatory centers, really pay attention to where every one of those dollars goes. We meet about it on a regular basis. We hire people to control costs, both of implants, of the dressings, of the drapes. All of these things are thought about the medications that we use before, before, during, and after. Is there one particular formulation that is cheaper uh, or more expensive? Is it worth it? And so when it comes to the dressings, similar discussion. Standard of care dressings, dry gauze, a, a simple bandage, those are very cheap. But are they what's best for your patient? And how do you rationalize or justify the use of a dressing that can be relatively expensive compared to a piece of gauze. And that's what I would like to frame in the next part of this discussion is how do you make that argument to utilize this more expensive dressing in an ambulatory setting, especially to an audience of surgeons who have a vested interest in the bottom line in that setting. And to me, that argument is all about infection prevention. So these videos, full disclosure, can be a little gross. So if you're squeamish, look away. But this is what we're trying to avoid. You open up a knee joint and it's full of infection. This patient is going to have a bad outcome. This costs the healthcare system. 
this is not good. Another interoperative video of infection, not quite as dramatic, but I would say equally as gross. And then finally, a very severe infection. This is actually of a hip and man, just as much as you don't want to see this, the patient doesn't want to go through this. And really, really, we try so hard to prevent these problems. We discussed this briefly before, but infections are a common source of cost for the healthcare system and a high reason why we revise hip and knee replacement surgeries. Estimated $1.6 billion cost to the healthcare system in 2020. The rates of hip and knee replacement surgeries, the primaries, the first go rounds is going up. So you figure there's risk for more and more infections moving forward. So what's the missing piece? How do you avoid these? That's the question that we often think about. And I think negative pressure dressings may not be the only piece to the puzzle, but I think they are a key piece. There's a lot of stuff that we do to prevent infection in our joint replacement patients. And I'd like to go through some of the most important ones with you now. Body mass index is important. We've learned that elevated body mass index increases your risk of having a perioperative or around the time of surgery joint infection, a PJI. Multiple good studies show the odds ratios go up if your body mass index is elevated. A lot of places have body mass index cutoffs for not only qualifying for a joint replacement, but specifically for the ambulatory surgery center. Uh, and a lot of those are because of this increased risk of prosthetic joint infection. Secondly, you can see this patient has a large abdomen that they develop a panis. And, and a lot of us do anterior approach total hip replacements, potentially a quicker recovery. A lot of patients ask for them, commonly done in the ambulatory setting. If you have a large panis, you worry about that wound healing. There's good evidence that shows those anterior approach wounds can be slow to heal. So if there's something we can do to optimize that healing environment in some of these patients with a higher body mass index, boy, maybe that's a patient that was borderline and you can say, I will do them at the ambulatory center as long as I can use a negative pressure dressing. I've seen that in my practice. That happens. And I feel much more confident doing total hip replacement surgeries on a patient with a panis, elevated body mass index, as long as I can use a negative pressure dressing. We have a cutoff of 37 at our ambulatory center. I did a patient whose isolated body mass index uh, risk factor was 41. They had no other risk factors, but their BMI was 41. And I put a negative pressure dressing on them. I explained to my partners that I thought it was safe for us to make an exception to the body mass index rule as long as we can use this dressing. They were all for it because the profit margin of a commercial pay or a good pay insurance patient justifies the use of that dressing complicated issues. But if a patient has what's called a metabolic syndrome where they have diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and hypertriglyceridemia, significant increased risk of infection if their body mass index is elevated too. So these are the patients that we really optimize. Diabetes is critical. Again, lots of good studies showing that elevated blood sugars increase your risk of having a wound infection around the time of surgery. So it's critical to get the hemoglobin A1C down. Uh, we've adopted a hard cutoff at eight. Some people are being even more conservative at 7.5 or even seven for the A1C. And really critical is the control of blood sugars around the time of surgery. Keeping those blood sugars down in the 110 to 180 range has been shown to be very important for decreasing infection risk. Malnutrition is important. The interesting paradox is the morbidly obese patient who's actually malnourished even though their weight is really high. And there have been uh, studies, specifically this one here out of Pennsylvania, showing five to seven times increased major wound problems if their nutrition markers are not adequate. Smoking. Here's just a list of some studies showing increased risk of wound healing problems. That picture is from one of my partners who uh, did a knee replacement on a patient whose only risk factor for a wound problem was the fact that they smoked. So we have adopted a policy where you don't get surgery. It's right there actually on the wall right there. You don't get surgery if you're using tobacco. We have you quit and we test you before surgery. 
Minimum four weeks, you have to pass a serum cottoning test. This tells you whether you're a non-smoker, a passive smoker, like you get secondhand smoke exposure, or if you're actively using. And if you don't pass, then we have to wait. And it's not a punitive thing. In fact, it's for our patient's benefit because we know that that increases their risk of developing wound healing problems. MRSA colonization is something that we look for. We identify patients who are higher risk for being colonized with this bacteria. These would be patients with obesity, patients who have recently been admitted to the hospital, healthcare workers, people who live in skilled nursing facilities. Those are the patients who we check to see if they are colonized with these bacteria. Because if they are colonized, then we decolonize them to decrease their perioperative risk. The interesting thing is that they have found that if you are colonized with these bacteria and you get a joint replacement, those same bacteria can end up causing a joint replacement infection. So we found that by identifying those patients, decolonizing them and optimizing them for surgery, we can decrease the risk of infection at the time of surgery. Surgical site preparation is important. There's a lot of good data supporting chlorhexidine use, not only at the time of right before you cut the skin, but even days before having patients shower with a chlorhexidine solution uh, before surgery. And then even in the preoperative area, having them wipe down with a chlorhexidine wipe and then using chlorhexidine to prep the skin not once, but twice at the time of surgery has been shown to decrease surgical site infection rates. So that is common practice uh, with hip and knee replacements, significant decrease in surgical site infection rates by doing that. This is the double prep that I was talking about. This patient gets their leg prepped one time and then it's draped and then it's prepped an additional time with a chlorhexidine solution. We then commonly apply an ioband, an iodine impregnated um, barrier to the operative extremity uh, before cutting the skin. It's, it's very important to properly prepare the skin of the surgical site before surgery. We put these signs up at our ambulatory center because it is critical to keep the operating theater doors shut. It's interesting. Uh, when we transitioned the care from the inpatient setting to our ambulatory surgery center for hip and knee replacements, the staff were not used to this because for a knee arthroscopy, for a carpal tunnel, they would commonly go in and out of the operating room. But there's good studies that show you can significantly decrease your risk of a perioperative infection just by maintaining that door to the unsterile hallway remains closed. So we put up these big stop signs to keep people from coming in and out of the operating room. And it took a little while for our ambulatory staff to catch on, but they are also very invested in the positive outcomes for our patients, so they very easily adapted to this change. Another thing that is commonly done after joint replacement surgery is DVT or blood clot prevention. There's been a lot of changes over the years in terms of how we prevent blood clots for our patients. We, the pendulum has swung from very strong blood thinners for everyone to very not very strong and then kind of where are you in between based on your risk factors. And the issue is, is that if you just think about culture media, how they grow bacteria in incubators, they often put blood in the auger. That's a very common way to blow, grow bacteria. So if you get a bunch of blood into the knee because you have a very thin blood, the chances of that getting infected, I think it just commonly makes sense that like common sense that that would be elevated. So avoiding a large hematoma in the knee can help decrease the risk of infection. So we try to avoid the aggressive DVT prophylaxis medications as much as possible whenever we can really for our patients and, and commonly try to use aspirin whenever it's medically safe. The way you close the incision matters. Literally everything, it seems, from the day you meet the patient until after you've completed the operation matters. This is a, a really cool study showing the different ways that you close the skin can change the perfusion to the soft tissues. A running subcuticular stitch has better perfusion than a mattress stitch and better perfusion than staples. And interestingly, the 
Closed incision negative pressure wound management system can increase the perfusion to the skin edges. This is a picture of what the system, this closed circuit is. And it's just a very simple application of this bandage that can improve perfusion to the skin edges and help this to heal. Now, I did two fellowships. I did a trauma fellowship and a joint replacement fellowship. And I did my trauma fellowship first and we use wound vacs and we use them for open, dirty wounds. And that's what I thought they were for, open, dirty wounds and fasciotomies. I didn't know you could put it on the closed skin and get it to heal. And when I first heard that, I was like, wait, what? That's not what I know wound vacs are for. But you absolutely can. And it's awesome because it changes the biology of the surgical field and the surgical bed. And we'll go through some of that basic science now. Negative pressure dressings decompress the soft tissues at the surgical site. Historically, the thought was you hurt the musculoskeletal system, you compress it to get the swelling out of it. But does that really help? Does that compression really help with recovery? Or does that lead to sedentary nature, constriction, restriction, and actually slow down somebody's recovery? Is it better to decompress that area, use the body's own fluid return system to get the extra fluid out of the surgical site, out of the traumatized field, and decrease swelling by decompression? And that's what negative pressure does. And that's the key concept that helps you understand why it works. It's decompressing the surgical field because you put that sponge on the skin, the skin's closed and it's pulling up, it's decompressing that area. It's also a physical protector of the wound. You put it on in the sterile operating room and it's sterile underneath of the bandage and it stays sterile until you remove that thing. It allows patients to be able to shower uh, with their dressing on without concern. And it's actually really well tolerated for patients. This is really interesting. It increases the uh, lymphatic flow and it increases the blood flow as well at the site of the operation. It decreases edema, decreases hematoma and seroma formation, stabilizes the wound from a mechanical standpoint, and it increases the wound breaking strength and gets it to heal faster histologically. We discussed this is what the system looks like, canister, tubing, and a sponge. The mechanical stabilization comes from a benchtop model showing that it required more force to separate the skin incisions compared to a standard of care dressing. This was using sutures and staples, and it was stronger for both with a negative pressure dressing. This is fascinating to me. If you put negative pressure on closed skin and look at the perfusion, you've got more perfusion to the place with negative pressure on it. I think of this as like what every kid has done. You take a vacuum and you put it on your arm and then you pull it off and you got a little purple spot there. It's a similar kind of idea to me. So you're pulling negative pressure on the skin and it changes what's happening in that area. And this is scientific evidence showing that the negative pressure actually increases the perfusion to that area, which is exactly what we want because that's how these things heal. And so increasing perfusion to the skin edges of your surgical incision is critical. Reduction of edema. Uh, this is a study uh, showing Pravina compared to a standard of care dressing, decreasing seroma formation in the incisions after arthroplasty procedures. Similar study showing reduction in hematoma and seroma formation with the use of negative pressure dressings. Prospective randomized controlled trial, pretty good evidence showing that it decreases seroma formation. This study is fascinating to me. This has to do with lymphatics flow. And I think that understanding this helps you understand why negative pressure works over closed incisions. This is a cool study where they injured some animals and they had nanospheres in the area of injury. And they either put a negative pressure dressing on it or didn't. And then look to see what happened to those nanospheres. And interestingly, in the patients or animals that had the negative pressure dressing, there was an increased number of those nanospheres that moved up through the lymphatic chain compared to the ones that didn't get negative pressure. So that demonstrates to me that the negative pressure is increasing the flow through the lymphatic system. That's how patients can use their own physiology, their own structure to decrease swelling 
through their own lymphatics after surgery. They're using their own infrastructure to move the fluid. It makes sense. This study uh, showed five days of negative pressure therapy had a stronger approximation of the suture line and the staple line. And histologically, it healed faster compared to standard of care. And here's a really cool picture showing both at five days, the one on the left without negative pressure, the one on the right with negative pressure. And just this is as simple as looking at the two pictures and saying, well, the one on the right sure looks like it's healed up more than the one on the left. And that's what I've seen in my practice too, is I'll put these negative pressure dressings on my revision patients. And I'm just very pleasantly surprised at how good they look at that two week mark. So that's the basic science. What's the clinical evidence? Well, multiple studies have looked at this negative pressure dressing after hip and knee revision surgery. And just look at the orange bar compared to the blue one. Significant drops in wound complications, surgical site infection, reoperation, and deep joint infection. This is a study by Dr. Cooper. Really good data showing decrease in all the things that we care about in our revision patients. If you look at periprosthetic fracture data, these are patients who commonly are not able to be optimized before surgery because they weren't expecting to have an operation. They just unfortunately had a fracture around one of their joint replacements. And so these are high risk patients. Often they're having big surgeries too. If you break your femur bone around an implant that requires a large dissection, a large implant, perioperative blood loss, anemia, in a non-optimized patients, that's a setup for a problem. So this study looked at Aquacel compared to a negative pressure dressing for patients who had periprosthetic fractures that were either fixed or revised. Similar data to what I just showed from Cooper's study. Wound complications and reoperation, significant drops. 35% to 3%, 25% to 3%. Deep infection rate, significant drop just by using a negative pressure dressing. That's like dramatic, remarkable data to me. And that's what changed my practice was looking into this and seeing that just by using a different dressing, you're getting these significant drops in infection and reoperation rates. This is what it looks like to put on a negative pressure dressing. This was a big hip case that I did where the patient had a periprosthetic fracture. I showed the picture of the x-ray a few slides ago. This is a customizable negative pressure dressing. I've got two deep drains in there that are just remote from the negative pressure dressing site. And you can shape this customizable one to cover your incision uh, completely just like we did here. And just by that simple step, decrease the patient's perioperative risk. Here's another study uh, by Dr. Higuera looking at negative pressure therapy after revision total hip and total knee replacements at high risk patients. Prospective randomized clinical trial, significant decrease wound complications, significant difference in reoperation rates. Another really good study showing that there are significant improvements and significant decreases in surgical site complications with negative pressure after revision surgery. 78% less likely to experience a complication. Pretty remarkable data. Additional study, prospective cohort, almost 200 patients with negative pressure compared to 400 standard of cares. Patient uh, treated with negative pressure, four times less likely to experience a surgical site complication compared to the controls. And now that's great. That's really good data. So we talked about the clinical evidence. We talked about the basic science as to why we think that clinical evidence exists. And a lot of that clinical evidence that I showed you is in these high-risk patients, the patients who are having either revision surgery or periprosthetic fracture surgery. But that's not really the ambulatory setting population. We talked about that. We talked about which patients we think are going to the ambulatory setting. And that's the primary hip and knee replacement patients. So where does negative pressure fall in this discussion. So to me, it's about driving more patients, the fringe patients, the ones where you're not sure if they could go to the ambulatory setting or not, and getting them to the ambulatory center. To me, that's patients with an elevated body mass index. It's this patient that you see with the panis hanging over the front, and you know that that's exactly what you're going to be operating through, and that makes you nervous to operate through that 
And so those patients, I use a negative pressure dressing on them. For me, my cutoff is if your body mass index is 37 or up and you're getting a total hip, you're getting a negative pressure dressing. Or if I either look at you and I know that it hangs over significantly like this, or we put you on a table and the panis is in the way, and I know that there's going to be a skin fold there, then I protect that with the negative pressure dressing. I've been really happy with that. You know, early on, I wasn't doing that in my practice. And I was getting patients that two to three weeks out from their operation will be coming back with parts of their wounds that are dehissed or they get some fat necrosis and you're having to pack those wounds. And in general, they do fine, but it requires wound packing. It requires return trips to the clinic. It requires a long counseling session. It's not at all what you're looking for when a patient signs up for an elective joint replacement. It's like, oh, this will be great. You'll feel better, but you're going to have to pack your wound for six weeks. Like patients, they're obviously not interested in that. So by avoiding that complication, you significantly improve your patient outcomes, their satisfaction, decrease the number of ER and urgent care visits and clinic visits too. I also use negative pressure dressings if I'm going to do a dual platelet therapy on a patient for medical reasons, or if I have to use one of these strong anticoagulants postoperatively to decrease their risk of getting a DVT. If I have to use one of these 10A inhibitors or something that's been shown to have a higher risk of hematoma formation or of wound drainage, I'll put a negative pressure dressing on that patient. If they require immune modulating medications for any host of medical regions, uh, those patients get a negative pressure dressing to me. We have adopted a no smoking policy that is not uniform across the United States. If you are operating on patients who are actively smoking, I think that it makes logical sense to utilize a negative pressure dressing. And so when, you know, recently we were deciding criteria of who gets to go to the ambulatory setting and who doesn't, you know, what's the red light, green light, yellow light criteria. And I think that negative pressure dressings can help move people from that kind of yellow light, not sure area into the green light area and get them over to that uh, surgery center with confidence that they're going to have lower complication rates because of that dressing. And so if we look back at this and we look and we say, wow, okay, in the next 10 years, there's going to be a significant increase in the number of cases of hip and knee replacement surgery that are done in the outpatient setting. There's a potential opportunity to utilize negative pressure to optimize our patients and make that number, which is already really high, even higher. Because that's not, I'm not satisfied with that. Uh, I want more. I want 90% of my patients that are getting hip and knee replacement surgeries, if not more, done at the ambulatory surgery center. We were recently talking about this with the partners. It's almost to the point where, listen, if you're safe enough to get a joint replacement, we want you optimized enough that we can do it at our ambulatory surgery center. And I think negative pressure dressings are going to help us get to that metric. I don't think it's unreasonable. Here's a picture of a lady that had knee replacements done by me, body mass index 48. Incision sealed up perfect. She had negative pressure dressings on each one of her incisions. She swore by her negative pressure dressings. This is one of my favorite quotes. This is a patient of mine who had a knee revision. And he had the negative pressure dressing, but the big restore one with the sponge that goes around the knee. And he's told me in the clinic visit, he's like, man, I was never swollen after surgery. I was expecting to be swollen like I was after my first operation. But ever since I took that purple sponge off, it's looked like this. And he demonstrated this video to me. I like like a normal knee. It's looked like a knee that's been in there for a year. And this was his six week visit. I just love that video because this to me shows you exactly what you're looking for. This is a patient who has had multiple operations on their knee. You can see they had that curvilinear sort of medial scar from some previous operation. And then they had a knee replacement scar. And then I went back in and revised their knee replacement. And at six weeks, no swelling, patient loves it, good motion. This is exactly what I'm shooting for. And negative pressure helps me obtain those goals. So back to our case for patient optimization. What did we do for this particular patient to help get her into the ambulatory setting? Well, we optimized her diabetes, decreased her A1C uh, down to less than seven. We said, you know, our hard cutoff at our setting, uh, our ambulatory setting is eight. So we got her down to below seven, which is great. 
Helped her lose weight, helped her get her body mass index down to 37. Uh, again, if it's an isolated risk factor, I think there is uh, opportunity to help those patients uh, as long as you counsel them appropriately. And negative pressure dressings can help you uh, to obtain uh, good outcomes even at these higher risk patients. This particular patient required a 10A inhibitor postoperatively, one of those stronger uh, blood thinners. And so uh, we were able to get away with using that without having any sort of hematoma or seroma formation because I think in large part due to our negative pressure dressing. We checked her nutrition labs to make sure that she wasn't malnourished in spite of being overweight. And we relied heavily on our primary care provider colleagues to help with smoking cessation. This particular patient quit at her six week visit and passed her serum cottonine test. Again, her preoperative visit, x-rays, there's no question as to what's going on here and that hip replacement's the right operation. Postoperatively, she has a beautiful looking total hip replacement. And she had just a very predictable, excellent postoperative course. She was very satisfied uh, with her ambulatory surgery experience. She was able to take her own dressing off, which I think patients can do. You know, there are some questions that I get from patients about the dressings. The most common things that I get asked are, how long does it stay on? And I tell them seven days. Can I shower with it on? And the answer to that is yes. I say you can go home today and shower with it on. If you'd like to, it's completely waterproof. And then the next question is, can I, how do I take it off? And it's actually really easy uh, to take the dressing off. It peels off like a bandaid. And if I explain it to them in a way that's consistent with something they already know, like everyone knows what a bandaid is, and you just say, that, hey, this is very similar to a bandaid. At seven days, you just peel it directly off and your incision will be healed and sealed underneath. Uh, and in general, people are very comfortable with that. We do occasionally get a call uh, for a question because things can happen, right? You could have a leak, they could not be comfortable taking it off, etc. So we send them home with a few uh, pieces of the plastic adhesive and tell them that if it leaks, look around the edges to see if you can see a spot that maybe you've inadvertently peeled up or something, and you can patch it very easily. And we'll occasionally have to talk someone through that on the phone. But in general, we have very few problems with these dressings. For the knee replacement patients, I actually hear very commonly with the uh, dressings that people like having them on. They like not having to look at the incision. People commonly ask me, uh, the sponge is completely dry. Why isn't there anything in the canister? And that's interesting because we don't want anything in the canister. And commonly, if there is something in the canister, it means there's a problem uh, because we do a running subcuticular stitch and I want that thing watertight. And the negative pressure is just changing the environment of the surgical wound. It's not collecting drainage from the canister. If a patient calls me and they say, hey, my canister is filling up. It's filled up once. It's filled up twice. What do I do? That's the kind of patient that you want to see back into the office and evaluate them in person and see if they're having a particular problem that requires a surgical intervention. So there is a little bit of counseling that needs to go on. I had to teach my ambulatory surgery center nurses what a negative pressure dressing is. A very similar talk to the one we had here about why we use it both basic science and clinical evidence, and explaining to them how to educate our patients about this. It's gotten to the point where when I sign a patient up for surgery, that's when I talk about these risk factors. That's when we talk about optimizing them. And if I know uh, that I'm going to use a negative pressure dressing, I will counsel them on it, even before their preoperative visit, just when we sign them up for surgery, so that they know what to expect. And that's been pretty well uh, received with patients. The other thing that's a bit different uh, because of COVID and because of our ambulatory center is a lot of our, our visits are telemedicine visits. And so in general, patients are very comfortable taking their dressings off themselves and not coming into the office. We'll often use a mid-level provider to talk them through taking their dressings off either on the phone or if they need to have a quick telemedicine visit to do it. That's something that we have now that 
we at least weren't doing pre-COVID, but we were kind of forced to do the telemedicine. And that's one way that we have been able to help our patients. Hey, just show me the video. Okay, yeah, don't grab it there. Grab it here. Pull it off just like that. Or of course, you know, we'll offer for them to come into the clinic uh, to have a dressing change. But if you just take a step back and you look at it in terms of big numbers, if you're, you know, if you're an institution that does 10,000, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 joint replacements in a year, if you can decrease the number of complications by, you know, even a few percent, that's a lot of numbers. That's a lot of unhappy patients. That's a lot of decreased costs. That's a lot of saved patient time, effort, surgery, morbidity, and it opens up other slots in your clinic that you can see uh, new patients and you're not looking at your other patients' wounds and talking them through uh, wound care issues. So that has been our sort of transition uh, to the ambulatory setting. And this, again, I think is just a, a great representation of how negative pressure fits in the ambulatory setting. I think that uh, we are going to continue to see more and more patients being driven to the ambulatory setting. I think that this is driven by the fact that orthopedic surgeons have a vested interest in their ambulatory centers, and we're getting more and more comfortable doing our joint replacements in that setting. This was already predicted before the pandemic, and I think the pandemic was a crucible for accelerating that transition. Physicians want ultimately good outcomes for their patients and safe surgical procedures for their patients. And optimizing patients for surgery is critical with hip and knee replacements. There's a lot of medical things that we can do to optimize patients before surgery, getting their diabetes under control, having them quit smoking, optimizing their body mass index, deciding what anticoagulants to use, cleaning their skin with the chlorhexidine solution, how we prep and drape the incision area at the time of surgery, and also critical in this discussion is how you close the incision and how you manage that incision postoperatively. I don't think that negative pressure dressings are for all patients in the ambulatory surgery center. I think that most orthopedic surgeons would agree with that. However, I do think that those patients with elevated risk factors, whether it be elevated body mass index for hip and knee replacements, an anterior panis on a hip replacement patient that you're doing an anterior approach total hip on, someone that you're going to use a stronger anticoagulant, if you happen to operate on someone who is currently smoking, or if they have to have some advanced immune modulating medications, one of these risk factors that increases their perioperative risk for infection, I think that utilizing a negative pressure dressing is indicated. It'll decrease the cost most likely because it'll prevent infection, not only improve patient outcomes, but eliminate some of those bundle busters and help drive business to the ambulatory surgery center and even accelerate that prediction of how many cases are going to be done in the ambulatory setting with regards to primary hip and primary knee replacements moving forward. I've been fortunate to be involved in a private practice that has an ambulatory center, and I've lived through these changes of not only COVID, but of a transitioning. The vast, well, all of our joints were done in the inpatient setting, and now we are doing a large percentage of them in the ambulatory center and are highly motivated to move even more into that setting as we experience good patient outcomes, good patient experiences, and overall success in that avenue in the ambulatory setting. There's great opportunity for growth in this arena. I think negative pressure dressings are going to be a part of that. And I've appreciated uh, the opportunity to share uh, my thoughts on this issue uh, with you in this session. I appreciate your attention uh, as we discussed the use of negative pressure dressings in the ambulatory surgery center. Again, thank you for your time and your attention. 